Hello, I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, your guide through the ARRL license manuals. The videos in this course follow the manuals section for section. You can get the ARRL license manuals from the source listed below the video. After you watch the video, dig into the corresponding section of the book, study the associated questions, and then come back for the next video. Now, when we talk about emergency communications, first I want to mention that ham radio and emergency communications are not synonymous. Uh, there are lots of hams who do lots of other things that aren't really into the emergency preparedness part of it and you will meet hams who are very into the emergency preparedness part. Don't feel guilty if this is not your thing. On the other hand, uh, it would be a good idea as a ham to get yourself uh, in a position where you can assist in an emergency. It's almost always when there's a natural disaster, some kind of man-made disaster, uh, that all the exotic fancy communications we have these days falls down and it ends up back on the shoulders of the amateur radio operators um, and this is to the point now where the American uh, Homeland Security uh, Department uh, tells local authorities that they need to include ham radio as part of their emergency response plans. Um, now there's an old military adage about how you do things with military. It's called organize, train, equip, and deploy. Uh, the organization means you it, you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing this in concert with other people. And believe me, in your area where you live, there are people who are organizing these things. You need to get yourself part of that. Training. Training means understand what to do in an emergency, what not to do, how, when, the whys, the wherefores, and so on. I'll talk in a moment about that. Equip means that you've got a radio that works, that can participate, that's got the battery power or solar power or whatever, so that you can be there for the duration. And when you've done organized train and equip, then you're ready to deploy and uh, do the actual things that you need to do. Now, let's talk a little bit uh, about this. This is a long section, and there are very few questions. Uh, that are there. There's just four questions, several pages of material. That's because simply passing a test doesn't make you a valuable asset in an emergency. It takes more than that. And that's why uh, they give you the extra material that's in here. The very first thing I want to mention is safety. Safety, personal safety, because uh, if you're operating under field conditions, I mean, it could be as simple as tripping over a, a tent peg uh, to uh, falling off a ladder, putting up an antenna to uh, electric shock. Uh, or electrocution, uh, too many people raise antennas near power lines, the antenna falls into the power line, uh, it can be pretty bad. Um, you also need to be aware of something, and I'll mention this now because this is kind of different from when uh, I was a young ham, and that is something called HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability Accounta uh, uh, Accountability Act, H-I-P-A-A. Uh, this act has uh, completely transformed the way the medical industry uh, handles private information and to keep it private. It really has in fact increased the privacy of the information. The fact that uh, uh, Joe Doe has had a heart attack and is on the way to the hospital, the part of that that's private is the Joe Doe had a heart attack. Okay, now you can say, I have a patient who went to the hospital, but you try not to use names, personal information, personal phone numbers, things like that, out over the air. Uh, if you must transmit that, uh, try to use something like a packet or a Morse code or something like that, not likely to be heard by the public. It becomes very important. People value their privacy. In the event of large-scale natural disasters like a hurricane in the Caribbean, the FCC will designate certain frequencies as emergency use only. These frequencies are for the use of people involved directly 
in uh, working with the disaster people. Now the way you find out what these frequencies are is that you need to be subscribing to the ARRL uh, weekly newsletter uh, because if the FCC declares an emergency they'll send a special note out uh, with what those frequencies are. Uh, and this, this is a case where ignorance is not an excuse. Uh, you don't want to stumble upon these. Um, and especially you don't want to jam them. I have been in the position of trying to relay emergency traffic with some absolute idiot uh, trying to jam me. And this uh, ham who did this did not have the courage to put his call sign on the air, but nonetheless was definitely trying to disrupt communications. That sort of behavior can land you in jail. We're not talking play here, we're talking for real. And anybody who interrupts emergency communications is uh, a person who can cause people to lose their lives, can cause injuries to be worsened because people can't get there on time. Uh, you're trying to play God, don't do that. Uh, you're really playing the devil uh, when you do that. Now, uh, in a really serious threat, when you have no other mechanism, we're talking about serious threat to life or property, uh, you can use anything. You can go outside of your normal bands, you can uh, go outside of the normal service, you can do quite a few things that you might like to do in order to uh, get that communications through. Uh, similarly, emergency services people can use your radio if that's the way that they, the only way that they can get that communications through. I live in a mountainous area and the normal uh, emergency communications frequencies handle most of the county, but there are parts of the county uh, where it's very, very mountainous, very rugged, and sometimes ham radio is the only way uh, in or out, so be aware of that. You still need to identify yourself. Now the distress call on the air is Mayday. Mayday, Mayday. Now the thing that needs to follow this, Mayday, and you first ask if anybody can hear you, and then the very first thing you've got to give them is your location. It's just like real estate. Location, location, location. Nobody can help you if they don't know where you are. Uh, for example, when I go motorcycling way high up in the mountains, I have a GPS with me uh, at all times so that I can give my precise location. Um, uh, you can also do it in terms of, well, I'm five miles uh, to the east of such and such a point. In some way to unambiguously uh, describe your location. If you don't know where you are, well then shame on you, you should. Um, that's where that uh, GPS comes in uh, mighty handy. Now there's an aspect of emergency communications that's really not an emergency, it's called public service, public service events. Uh, for example, here in Uray County we have two large uh, foot races every year. Uh, one is a 50 mile marathon uh, through the mountains over the high mountain passes and the other is the uh, Imogen Pass Run uh, that goes from Ure to Telluride uh, every year and foot races, very high mountain passes and so on. Uh, our Montrose Amateur Radio Club provides uh, communications for both. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's something uh, great to go do. You can use tactical call signs for this. For example, at the last one I worked on, I was at Upper Camp Bird. So if somebody needed to talk to Upper Camp Bird, uh, they would say something like uh, this. Upper Camp Bird, this is Lower Camp Bird. We're trying to find a runner. Okay. Now, when we're done with that exchange, I still have to identify myself and say, this is Upper Camp Bird, KE0OG. Uh, so we get those stations in there. But the good part about that is, if I were taking a break and somebody else were watching Upper Camp Bird, when they called for Upper Camp Bird, they'd get the person on duty, rather than me, because I'm taking a break. So you see it works a little bit better, but you still need to identify. You've got to do the identification, don't forget that. Now, there are organized uh, organizations, um, ARES, Amateur Radio Emergency Services, and RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. 
Racy's has a little bit more legal recognition uh, with the FCC, uh, and so therefore the requirements are a little more stringent. ARES uh, does essentially the same thing without uh, some of the legalities getting in the way. Uh, both of those organizations get themselves written into the local emergency communications plans for the local authorities. What I would suggest that you do is contact the ARES director in your area. You can get his or her name from the uh, website, RRL website, uh, so that you can start to get some training. Now, let me uh, mention something about training. The um, Department of Homeland Security at, at FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has a series of uh, courses that you can take, anybody can take, uh, on the web, and you can get a certificate from those. And the reason why it's important to take those courses is this, because these courses walk you through how uh, the civilian world is organized to respond to uh, emergencies, to disasters, to whatever. There's a whole sequence of things starting with the command post and all of these other incident command center and so on. And what these training sessions will do is teach you the vocabulary, uh, teach you who does what, uh, so that you know what part you take, what role you're expected to play, what you have to do, what you don't have to do, and so on. And uh, the courses are only about an hour each. You can do one a night, four nights, you'll have them done. Uh, this is very important. Now, training you need to have, but it's no substitute for actually getting out there and doing something. And every year the ARRL sponsors what's called a simulated emergency test, more commonly referred to simply as a set. Uh, a set is a chance to go through this entire structure with the Incident Command Center and everybody and you're sending simulated traffic and so on. Now I participated uh, for the first time in one of these uh, this past year and it was an eye-opening experience. First of all it was a lot of fun uh, but second I found out that the way I had my station set up didn't really work very well. For example, there were two HF radios that I kept, or two HF frequencies that I kept having to go between. And the problem was that uh, I hadn't put them in memory, so I was constantly retuning. So, lesson learned put the frequencies in memory so you can just bank, 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 back and forth. Uh, the same with the VHF, which I had also in the room with me. Now, I often do HF with headphones, and I wasn't hearing the VHF radio. People were calling me on the VHF radio, and I wasn't hearing them because I was doing something, I was listening to HF. A lesson learned, either feed the audio to one of the ears or just put one of the earmuffs aside a little bit so I can hear the VHF. In fact, um, this being my first time, I made a list of my lessons learned. Now, you are useless as a ham radio operator if your radio has no power source. A handheld radio with dead batteries is a brick. It's of no use to anybody. So, if you're going to participate, you need to have a source of emergency power. Now think about this. Uh, the batteries in your radio, will the charge will only last for so long. If you have no way to recharge it, uh, often there is a special battery pack that you can purchase for your radio that you can put double A's in. Um, you really ought to have that. Get that battery pack so you can go quite a while with double A's. They go bad, you just put double A's in there. This is kind of the way the emergency services personnel handle things with these double uh, A batteries. Uh, another thing is, can you power your handheld from your car battery? Do you have the necessary cables and equipment to do that? Uh, do you have the ability to use a mobile antenna with your handheld? Uh, now, if you run out of gasoline, what do you do then? Um, I use solar uh, power. In fact, I power my ham radio station normally with the solar power. Uh, but that may be, you know, getting a little bit more than maybe you want to get invested in this. Uh, I don't run solar power for emergencies. I just run it because I like renewable energy, and that was one of the things that I uh, did as part of that. Now, um, if you want to say you have to go somewhere to handle an emergency, hams who do this keep what they call a go kit uh, that's got the radio, the cables, the power, the antennas, um, 
everything in there. Now when you get out there you will probably also need pencil and pens and paper. You'll need some sort of a light so that you can power your, so you can see what you're doing uh, in a, a dark EOC or after dark or whatever it may be. Um, it could be simple as a little 12 volt bulb that hooks to your uh, battery or it could be uh, maybe better uh, a little LED light or a separate flashlight with a little stand or something like that so that you can operate hands-free. Another thing that you may want to look into is a headphones because uh, emergency operations centers can be very noisy so it might be good to have headphones and uh, message blanks and, and a copy of the deployment plan and all of these kinds of things like that are very handy to have in the go kit. It's a lot more than just the radio itself. And so there we have it emergency communications. I again reiterate you don't have to do this as a ham. You may want to be more interested in something else but a lot of hams uh, do emergency communications. It's certainly not my focal point for the hobby but I've done lots of it. Uh, back before the days of auto patch I would call in accidents that I came across very often. I was the first person to give the information to the authorities. Uh, this is something you really want to think about, keeping your ham radio station on the air uh, during an emergency. And remember, I started with this mantra, I'll end with it, organize, train, equip, deploy. You can't deploy until you've organized, trained, and equipped. And so, next time you're faced with an emergency uh, situation, you'll know what to do. Thanks for following along with the videos and the book. After you've studied this section in the manual and are satisfied you understand the questions and their answers, come back here for the next video. The ARRL is the National Association for Amateur Radio and I urge you to join, even if you don't have your license yet. That way you get QST, the League's monthly magazine full of articles for beginners and veterans alike, or you can choose On the Air, a magazine designed specifically for those new to amateur radio. Until we next meet, 73.